This is a topic I've been meaning to address for a long period of time, uh, but I had an isolated incident happen to me on TikTok that I think is very emblematic of what's happening on social media, specifically within the healthcare or medical community that I find to be very, very problematic. And I wanna say on the outset of this video, this is not intended to attack anybody, there's gonna be a reason why we cut out everyone's names out of the video, their usernames, because the purpose of this is to get the medical community on the same page, to make sure that we improve our communication style, myself included, and learn from situations just like this one in order to facilitate the message of greater good or public health. A month ago, I posted a short, uh, a cut down of my interview with Sebastian Maniscalco on the topic of RSV. Right now with RSV, one of the leading theories of why there's such a run on hospitals is because generally kids get RSV in their first three years of life. There's like a 50% chance each year that they get their first episode. And their first episode with RSV is usually the worst, the time that where they need breathing treatments, maybe ICU stay. And we've held our kids back from school, grandparents and everybody that could have gotten them sick for the last two years. Mm. So now the children that would have gotten it each year have all gotten it at the same time. And it was their first time. So it kind of creates a run on hospitals. That's the leading theory. RSV RSV is a respiratory virus that actually affects people of all ages, but it happens to be worse in the very young and the elderly. What's been going on in our communities is that we've seen higher rates of hospitalization for children with RSV over the last season, which means basically starting late October, November. And we had some theories circulating as to why that was going on. I presented one of the leading theories, and I specify one of the leading theories very strongly here because I largely believe as a physician myself who treats children that this is a multifactorial situation, meaning that there's probably multiple factors and multiple theories that are to be true and each of them have holes because they do not on their own explain the given spike in RSV hospitalizations. The theory of COVID co-infection, flu co-infection, and immune dysregulation, partially true. The fact that the timing has been thrown off and our seasonal patterns have been thrown off. The fact that pregnant patients weren't exposed to RSV while pregnant, um, therefore transfer less protection for newborns, partially true. The one that I presented spoke to the fact that children uh, over the last two years or so had less exposure to RSV because we were protecting them from COVID. We were uh, not having normal activities, normal interactions. Their siblings were not going to school. Their parents were not going to work. And as a result, they had less exposure to RSV. When you have less exposure, um, you are less likely to get RSV. And children who get RSV for the first time usually get a worse case of RSV. I wasn't saying anything about children's immune systems. I wasn't saying anything about our mitigation methods for COVID. I was simply saying that because they had less exposure to RSV, that more children were exposed to RSV this season as we're going back to regular life. And as a result, more of them were getting it for the first time, which means more severe cases. So it's basically just a timing issue, nothing to do with the strength or, or, or weakness of their immune systems. In fact, it, this theory about the timing being thrown off uh, was not my theory. It happens to be one of the leading theories. That was spoken uh, in news by New York Presbyterian Hospital. Uh, it was on ABC News. Doctors on NPR talked about this. Dr. McGeer from University of Toronto said it perfectly in this interview. There's no question in my mind that the biggest impact uh, of this, this you know, excess in, in illness in kids and in our ICUs is related to the fact that kids just weren't exposed to RSV. After posting this TikTok, I got comments from other doctors who were debating uh, the validity of this theory, whether this is the theory that explains the recent spike in RSV. And some of their arguments were right. I actually agreed with their arguments. They were saying that in Sweden, uh, they did not have as strict of a lockdown, and yet they're still having this spike. Why is that the case? And I'm not an expert on Sweden, by the way. I, I, I don't know exactly what their healthcare system is like, so I don't even pretend to know that. One of the theories going around right now is about COVID immune system dysregulation. 
that some doctors believe that all these children that have had COVID in the past have a weakened immune system, therefore, as a result, RSV affects them more. There may be some truth in this because any co-infection, whether we're talking about COVID, flu, rhinovirus, these types of co-infections can make your immune system have fluctuations in its ability to fight other viruses. So that, that's partially true. There's some uh, even data showing that some immune cells are impacted by having COVID in the past. The concept of immunity debt has popped up among certain circles where they believe having children protected from exposure has led them to have a weakened immune system. And this is not what I was saying. This is not how immune systems work. Yes, there is a hygiene theory that long-term, chronically, over the course of our lives, if we hyper-protect ourselves from bacteria and constantly uh, disinfect everything, it could have a meaningful impact of our lives. But over the course of one or two years, protecting children from a serious situation like COVID that initially we knew very little about, and then we learned more, and it was very scary, and our hospital systems were overwhelmed, will not impact their immune system so much so that they're weakened. That is not what I was saying, and anyone pushing that is inaccurate. To my disappointment, this past week, I started seeing an increase of attacks from other medical professionals on this TikTok that I did not expect. Because I totally see how we can debate what is the reason for this RSV spike, but I started seeing personal attacks. In fact, there was one comment that upset me because the person came in and said, wow, you pretend to be a so-called doctor in quotes, here's an immunologist perspective. And it was like a personal attack on me as if I'm not a real doctor treating patients. When I have RSV patients, I have COVID patients, I give guidance, I strive to be the best doctor that I can. I've tried to be an accurate voice with evidence-based medicine throughout the pandemic. And to have this doctor do a personal attack on me, it upset me, so I blocked them. In fact, that was one of my New Year's resolutions to try and not pay attention to the negative comments as much that I don't feel are reflective of who I am as a person and block and move on. But when I blocked, said person, they created content around the fact that I blocked them as if I was silencing their medical voice, that I am a medical grifter, that I am the same as Dr. Oz in fueling misinformation, which is so disheartening because the whole reason this YouTube channel exists is to put out evidence-based medicine. So to be accused of spreading it myself just, just kills me because it doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Why are, are people doing this? Some of the negative comments pointed out that I was blocking and deleting comments from people who disagreed with this theory that I was presenting. And that's not the case. I believe in healthy discourse and debate. We need more of it. It just needs to stay respectful because the only reason I blocked the individual I mentioned earlier was they started personally attacking me. In life, if you ever want to have a meaningful conversation or even a debate with someone, you can't start it off by saying, so you're a so-called doctor, or call them a name, and hope that they're gonna listen. These same people who say these things about me and attack me, also have been attacked themselves and know what it feels like. So we have to approach this empathetically. We need to do a better job uh, in social media when it comes to healthcare communication. These are still sort of hurdles that we need to get across as communicators when it comes to a public health setting. And I think it's really important that we move away from toxicity within the medical community. Because otherwise what happens is it fractures our ability to educate people. We, we fuel tribalism. We, we lead people more confused than educated. They feel like this person knows the answer and this person's evil, this person's bad. And this type of dichotomy, this black or white thinking is unhealthy because medicine is not 100% science. There is an art to it. There are individual distinctions that need to be made per patient. That's why generalized medicine is not the same as what is the, accurate for the person sitting in front of you. So please, doctors online, I know that we've been attacked throughout the last few years for putting out accurate information. We uh, have seen a rise, a tremendous rise in misinformation, but do not lead this to create displacement anger on other physicians or other individuals or even your patients 
who may say things that you disagree with, you may find slightly inaccurate, because the more we attack and the more we label everything as misinformation, the more it takes away our ability to be true fact checkers and educators. I'm actually such a fan of healthy debate. I love it when people tell me that I'm wrong and have a meaningful discussion with me. You've told me I've, I've been wrong several times, and here's a full video with all the mistakes that I've made in my videos over the last few years. I hope you enjoy it, and I hope, as always, you stay happy and healthy.